from uh, about 15 years on up, uh, a great deal of my thoughts were uh, basically unshareable. We are all evil in some form or another. Yes, I am evil. Not 100%, but I am evil. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and very sad woman. I hated her, but I wanted to love my mother. This is Serial Killing, a podcast. Hello again, and welcome to Serial Killing, a podcast. This is Alyssa Carroll, and I am your host and the creator of at serial underscore killing on Instagram, where we go through the life stories of serial killers to see if we might catch a glimpse of why they displayed their famous, vile, and disturbing behaviors. This week's podcast will be on Herbert Mullen. Herbert William Mullen was born on April 18, 1947 in Salinas, California, so let's get into some history for that time. In 1947, we had the alleged finding of the UFO in Roswell, New Mexico. On July 7th, an unknown object crashed near Roswell, New Mexico. The U.S. military insisted it was a high-altitude surveillance balloon. But the next day, a Roswell Army airfield officer issued a statement that he and other personnel had recovered a crashed, quote, flying disc from a ranch near Roswell. President Harry S. Truman outlined the Truman Doctrine to Congress, which spoke on the importance of helping secure the democracies of foreign nations that were facing foreign and domestic authoritarian threats, thus beginning the Cold War. His doctrine was to prevent the spread of communism in Europe, as well as blocking the Soviet Union's influence in Greece and Turkey after World War II. In the UK, they nationalized their coal mines. They created the National Coal Board, or NCB, to run the mines. NCB took more than 1,500 mines that had been owned by like 850 coal companies, which were paid handsomely, and they managed to increase production along with improving working conditions for miners. They added benefits, they raised wages, and cut the work week to just five days. In Polynesia, Thor Heyerdahl's balsa wood raft, called the Kontiki, landed in a reef at Raiora in the Tuamotu Islands. The raft carried six men and landed on an uninhabited islet off Raiora Islet in the Tuamotu group of islands after over 100 days at sea, traveling 4,300 miles across the Pacific Ocean, thus proving that prehistoric people could very well have traveled over from South America. Now also in 1947, the United Nations voted in favor of the creation of an independent Jewish state of Israel. They recommended the partition of Palestine into two separate states, one Arab and one Jewish. The city of Jerusalem would be under the direct administration of the United Nations. India and Pakistan also became independent nations after the Indian Independence Bill went into effect. They had both previously been under British rule for over 200 years. This independence movement was largely influenced by Gandhi and his nonviolent resistance. Now, as for the cost of living in 1947, the average cost of a new house was about $6,600, and the average car cost only about $1,300. Average yearly wage was $2,900, and a gallon of gas was just 15 cents. So this was the atmosphere that Herbert was born into. 
His father was Martin William, or Bill, as he was called, Mullen, and his mother was Jean Claire Baker. Herbert did have one older sister named Patricia. Now, Bill was a World War II veteran, considered a military hero, actually. He was described as strict, but never abusive. He was proud of the time he spent in the military and spoke about it often. He was also described by many as a very good father, playing with his children after work and on weekends. During the week, Bill worked as a furniture salesman, and he would wrestle and play fight with Herbert growing up, as a lot of fathers do. Jean was devoutly Catholic and was actually a bit, quote, oppressively religious, unquote, according to Bill, but she was a very good mother and she loved her children dearly. Herbert was described as sweet-natured and very intelligent. When he was five years old, the family moved from their smaller farming community into San Francisco. Once he got old enough to start going to school, he joined his sister at a private Catholic school. He was an altar boy. People that knew the family had nothing but complimentary things to say. It was obvious that they were a well-adjusted, loving, and educated family. Herbert had a good relationship with his sister and his parents. He maintained excellent grades. He was happy and he made friends easily. Around sixth grade, his family moved again to Felton, California, which was kind of a small town amongst the historic, iconic, majestic giant redwood trees in Santa Cruz County. And side note, that is such a bucket list item for me to see. While Herbert was uprooted at a vulnerable age, it took him no time at all to make friends. And in fact, he was among the popular crowd. He involved himself in sports such as varsity football. He had a steady and close girlfriend throughout high school. He was even voted most likely to succeed. So basically, there was absolutely nothing in his early years, nor any family history that I could find, or even, you know, physical injury that would remotely suggest that what he would later go on to do had any kind of reasoning. I mean, there was nothing. Herbert was just about as all-American, upper-middle-class, well-adjusted teen that you could ever imagine. And I realize that's probably the shortest childhood profile I've ever done, but sincerely, there's just nothing there. He had a wonderful childhood, parents that doted on him. His father played with him. He was a shining example of sacrifice and work ethic. His mother was quite religious, but a lot of families are, and that's perfectly fine. There was zero evidence of any abuse, neglect, nothing. Guys, no abandonment, no attachment, disordered issues that we frequently see in a lot of serial killer cases. No mommy issues, no bullying, nothing. So what the hell happened? Well, he graduated from San Lorenzo Valley High School in 1965, and he enrolled at a college to study engineering. The summer before college was to begin, Herbert's best friend, Dean Richardson, was killed in a car or motorcycle accident, and he was completely devastated. Very quickly after this, Herbert began to display very odd behaviors. He, quote, fell into a state of macabre despair, unquote, building kind of like shrines to his fallen friend in his bedroom, where he stayed for hours at a time. His mind began swirling around the idea that Dean's death was, quote, some sort of cosmic sacrifice, and he became concerningly obsessed with reincarnation. This turned into Herbert passionately studying Eastern religions like Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, Shinto, and so on. 
And while his parents admired his want to learn, of course, they were very concerned with the, you know, manic pace and state of mind he was in while doing so, as well as the way that he had begun to withdraw from society. Now, Herbert did manage to go to class for a while, though he changed his major from engineering to philosophy and then dropped out a few weeks later. The next year, he happened to run into a mutual friend of Dean's named Jim. Now, remember Jim, he comes into play later. Jim offered him some marijuana and they sat and discussed the anti-war movement. Herbert's longtime friend Loretta described him as a great boyfriend and that they had spent a lot of good and quality time together. They had even become engaged at one point, but then he began to blow her off and abandoned her once he started doing hallucinogenic drugs. In 1968, he finally told her that he might be homosexual and that their relationship was over. He then sort of adopted the hippie lifestyle, and with the Vietnam War raging, he registered as a conscientious objector, which, for those that don't know, is a person who claims the right to refuse to perform military service on the grounds of freedom of thought, conscience, or religion. Sometimes these individuals, at least maybe in other countries, are able to be assigned to an alternate civilian service, you know, kind of as a substitute. All he had to do was wait and see if that status would be approved. Now, coming from a father who was a proud veteran, Bill was horrified that his son had declared himself a conscientious objector. But then the family kind of began to pick up on some rather troubling behaviors. At first, they just assumed that he was being rebellious, and that was just how many young adults were acting. It was the sign of the times, the late 60s. You know, we've been through it. One source stated he had the words, quote, legalize acid tattooed on his stomach. Herbert announced that he was going to go to India to study yoga. He began stressing that a huge, cataclysmic earthquake was about to hit. Then he went to his sister's house for dinner, you know, to visit, only he began mimicking every single action that her husband took while they were eating, every gesture, every word, and this went on for hours. He asked his sister to have sex with him, and when she obviously refused, he turned and asked her husband to have sex with him, and he too turned him down. So the next day, his family took him to a mental health facility and he willingly admitted himself. You know, he was an adult now. There, he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and that the drugs were exacerbating it. So let's talk about that for just a bit. Paranoid schizophrenia is a form of schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a serious mental illness that can be quite disabling without care. It's a type of psychosis, right? So what your mind understands and what reality actually is, do not agree. It deeply affects how you think and how you behave. People with schizophrenia might hear voices, have visual hallucinations, and some even believe other people are controlling their thoughts. Now, all of this can scare the person suffering and it leads to erratic behavior. Now, schizophrenics with paranoid delusions are unreasonably suspicious of others. The delusions seem real to them, regardless of evidence against it. It makes it exceptionally hard for the person to hold a job, to go run errands, to maintain relationships, or even seek medical help and it's a lifelong illness. It usually presents itself in the very late teens to late 20s. It's uncommon for the symptoms to come on before or after that, but it's not out of the question. LSD hallucinations resemble the kind of hallucinations experienced by schizophrenic patients and can intensify those symptoms. And 
genetics are considered one of the primary causes of schizophrenia. But it's not one single gene that causes it. It's actually the result of a complex group of genetic and biological vulnerabilities. So while Herbert was in this hospital, he underwent therapy and began medications and was released six weeks later. But as you can imagine, he didn't follow his treatment plan and the doctors warned him that his prognosis was not good if he didn't cooperate. He moved to Lake Tahoe. He worked as a dishwasher at a casino resort, but then moved back in with his parents in Santa Cruz. So one day, a park ranger happened upon Herbert sitting in the forest, looking as though he was meditating, you know, staring off into space. The ranger told him that he needed to leave, but Herbert didn't move. He seemed to be, like I said, in a trance, but the ranger noticed that his hand was slowly moving to his side where there was a knife. So the ranger subdued him before Herbert could attack and he took him to jail. He was released shortly after. Herbert then wandered around down a little bit south of Santa Cruz and he found a roommate and he settled in. He then told his roommate that he was, quote, receiving messages that were instructions, but he didn't elaborate. He then began to burn the end of his penis with a cigarette ritualistically. He made an aggressive pass at a male friend. That male friend's uncle was a psychiatric doctor who had Herbert committed to a mental hospital. This is what was said about him, quote, as a result of mental disorder, said person is a danger to others, a danger to himself, and gravely disabled, unquote. He was diagnosed yet again with paranoid schizophrenia and he was committed for eight weeks. Now his parents did come to visit him several times while he was in the hospital and when he was released, again, he was told that if he did not stick to his treatment plan, his prognosis was extremely poor. So, you know, of course, he didn't stick with it. For the next several months, his mental health deteriorated quickly. He was in and out of mental hospitals. He was picked up by police several times for different offenses, usually drugs. Somehow, Herbert found a hippie commune in Santa Cruz and he decided he wanted to live with them. But of course, it took all of two seconds for him to make them extremely uncomfortable. But he also met an older woman, Pat Brown, and he accompanied her on a trip to Hawaii. I'm not sure why she went there. I just know that he went with her. Now, she of course would go off to do her own thing, and this made Herbert feel like he had been abandoned, so he committed himself to yet another mental institution in Maui. The doctors there diagnosed him with schizoaffective schizophrenia. So that's schizophrenia with the added diagnosis of a mood disorder like bipolar type or depressive type. And yet we see another repeat of his cycle. He was released, he went back home to his parents, he left them, was readmitted to another hospital, rinse and repeat. He told others that he was receiving messages from God or Einstein and he was being given these important missions. He also became hyper-focused on art, mostly Leonardo da Vinci, spending countless hours at the library reading and researching. His mother even bought him a book about the artist. He became obsessed with Albert Einstein, believing the two had a connection and that Einstein was convincing him of special work that Herbert needed to get done. Now, Herbert was aware that something was wrong with him, which is why he jumped from one subject to another, just, you know, trying to figure out what it was. He felt someone had sabotaged his mind. He shaved his head. He took on a macrobiotic diet and lost an alarming amount of weight. He then changed to wearing a large sombrero and he faked a Spanish accent. 
then changed and decided to be a boxer. He preached that he was anti-violence, but then would do things like throwing a hatchet at a fireplace when an Asian woman refused to have a baby with him. He actually tried joining the Marines and believe it or not, he passed the physical and psychiatric tests, but was not allowed in after his arrest record was discovered. So in September of 1972, he moved back in with his parents in Santa Cruz again. He said the voices were becoming louder and more persistent and demanding. He fixated on his father and developed an intense hatred toward Bill because he believed his father was the reason he had so many problems. He said his father was too sexually uptight. He accused his father of being a mass murderer, among other things, which of course horrified Bill, who had been trying to help his son. One month later, Herbert began to murder, and there was another really famous murderer who was striking at the exact same time in the same area, the Edmund Kemper, which would label Santa Cruz in that period of time as the serial killer capital. On October 13, 1972, Herbert saw an older man hitchhiking along a remote part of the highway. He pulled over and told the man he was having engine trouble and, you know, could he take a look? While the man was bent down looking under the hood, Herbert got a baseball bat that he had stashed in his car and he beat this man to death later saying that the man had sent him a telepathic message that said, quote, kill me so that others will be saved, unquote. Herbert left the body on the side of the road and it was found the next day. Not long after, 24-year-old Mary, a college student, was hitchhiking back home where Herbert saw her. He pulled over, he picked her up. While he was driving, he took out his knife and stabbed her through the heart. And even though she was obviously dead, he kept stabbing her over and over. He then pulled over and, disclaimer, disclaimer, he took her body out of the car and into a bushy area where he disemboweled her and strung up her intestines in the tree branches. He later said he did this to check the intestines for, quote, pollution. Ed Kemper was actually suspected of her murder at first. So a week after that murder, Herbert entered St. Mary's Catholic Church, where Father Tomei walked out to see if anyone was there wanting to do confession. Now, Father Tomei was originally from France and had helped in the French underground during World War II against the Nazis, and he had moved to the States after the war. Herbert was sitting in the confessional booth. He confessed his sins, telling the priest of his murders. He then proceeded to get out, walk around, and stab the priest to death. A woman who had entered the church saw what was happening, and she said Herbert was stabbing the father repeatedly and also stomping him, and she ran from the scene. She did give a decent description of Herbert. So, remember Jim, the guy that introduced him to marijuana? Okay, so Herbert said, quote, Jim spearheaded a movement to befuddle and confuse me, unquote, and that the pot Jim gave him damaged his brain. He said, quote, if he had given me some Benzedrine instead, I would have become an artist, unquote. In January 1973, Herbert decided to kill Jim. He went to where Jim had been living, only a woman was living there now, but she gave Herbert his forwarding address. Once he arrived, he and Jim began to argue, and Herbert shot Jim three times, but Jim was able to run upstairs and into the bathroom where his wife was having a shower. Herbert, of course, gave chase, he shot Jim again, which finally killed him, and then he shot Jim's wife five times and then proceeded to stab her even though she was already dead. 
He then returned to the house where the lady had given him Jim's new address, you know. He killed her and her two sons by shooting and stabbing them. The children were just four and nine years old. A month later, Herbert was walking around in Henry Cowell Redwoods State Park, and he came across these four teenage boys who were camping there, illegally of course. He walked up to them, and he told them he was a park ranger, and he said that they needed to leave because they were polluting the forest, but the boys refused. Herbert shot all four of them to death, and then he left. Their bodies were not found for a week. Three days later, Herbert was driving around when he saw retired fisherman Fred Perez working in his yard. This was broad daylight. Herbert turned the car around. He got out. He kind of positioned himself, balancing the gun on the hood of his car. He shot this man in the heart, killing him. Again, broad daylight, so there were a lot of witnesses, and the police were able to pull him over just minutes later, and he did not resist arrest. Now, once arrested, he readily confessed, saying he had to kill all of those people to prevent a massive earthquake from happening. And then, you know, of course, eight days after his arrest, a 5.8 magnitude earthquake did strike in Southern California. Herbert was ultimately charged with 10 murders due to the fact, for example, that Jim's murder was premeditated. He was found sane and he was found guilty of first degree murder for the premeditated one. So for Jim, Jim's wife, the woman and the two kids, he was found guilty of second degree murder for his more impulsive ones. Now, Herbert blamed his mother for the murder of the female hitchhiker because she had bought him that book about Michelangelo, whom he knew had carefully dissected bodies to learn every muscle, tendon, and so on for his art. Herbert believed his mother gave him the book as a hint to dissect someone. Now, his mother, his poor mother was horrified, of course. Herbert said his father commanded that he kill people. He said that he distinctly heard his father tell him, quote, Why won't you give me anything? Go kill somebody. Move. Unquote. Herbert also said, quote, If I was allowed to go into the Coast Guard or the Marine Corps, I would not have taken all of those people's lives. Unquote. So, as some of you probably already know and were waiting so patiently for me to bring up, Yes, Herbert and Edmund were housed in jail cells across from each other. Ed and his infinite intelligence evaluated Herbert from his cell and he stated, quote, Yes, judging from my years at Atascadero, I would say he is mentally ill, unquote. Now, Edmund had already accepted his fate. He was well behaved and so on, which is a good thing because as most of us know, Edmund is six foot nine inches tall and he was not a small boy. And Herbert was all of five foot seven, a little scrawny thing. This is what Ed had to say about their time around each other. This is great, you'll love it. Quote, well, he had a habit of singing and bothering people when somebody tried to watch TV. So I threw water on him to shut him up. Then when he was a good boy, I'd give him some peanuts. Herbie liked peanuts. That was effective because pretty soon he asked permission to sing. That's called behavior modification treatment." Unquote. And as fun as that sounds, Ed wasn't particularly fond of Herbert, calling him a creep with no class and saying, quote, he's just a cold-blooded killer, killing everyone he saw for no good reason, unquote. And Herbert was no fan of Ed's either, constantly complaining about the noise Ed made while Herbert was trying to meditate. Now, Ed has very famous mother issues, as most of us know quite well, whereas Herbert had father issues for the most part. Herbert killed a Catholic father. 
He killed a retired war veteran. You see a little bit of a pattern. He said his father prevented him from learning the healthiness of being bisexual and said that homosexuality starts when boys reach the age of eight, but his father intentionally hid that from him. Herbert demanded his father's fingerprints be taken and compared with all known murders in California and Oregon since 1925. And this, of course, was complete nonsense. So Herbert has a website, and no, I'm not kidding. It's herbertwilliammullen.org, all one word. And I'll throw the link down in the description notes. And it's interesting, to say the least, you should go have a look if you're curious. So, I think it's pretty self-explanatory what happened in this case. Again, no reports of abuse, neglect, you know, both parents raised him in a positive environment. His mother was very religious, but again, a lot of children are and turn out fine. His father was very much a part of his life, even playing with him constantly. He developed paranoid schizophrenia that was exacerbated by his drug use, more importantly, LSD. That is not to say that paranoid schizophrenics go on to be murderers. It's just unfortunate that Herbert did. What do you think about this case? Leave me a comment on Instagram at serial underscore killing or YouTube under the same name of this podcast. You can visit my website at SerialKilling.Squarespace.com and also consider sponsoring the podcast. It takes a lot of time and hours to do these, but I love it. I have a Patreon. So thank you so, so much for listening. I really do truly appreciate every one of you because I know you could be listening to anyone else, but you chose me. Thank you and have a great day.